Okay, ready? All right, time for this short video. I love that short little video. Doesn't it say so much about what's important? So what emotions were the people in that video feeling? What did you pick up? What did you notice? What were they, what were they feeling? Joy. Joy. Elation. elation. What a good word. Three syllables there. Excellent. All right. <laughs> elation. Shock. Shock. Anything else? Relief. Relief. Yes, relief. OK. All right. Yeah, yeah, it's okay now. Yeah, sense of security that came with that, sense of relief. Surprise, a bit like the shock. Anything else? Joy. Just a lot of positive emotions. Yeah, they, it was just an outpouring, wasn't there? A, a natural surprise and shock followed by a rejoicing, a positive. I, I like the particular picture of that fat fellow with his backpack just going, yes, like that. So, so that's right. It's elation. It's joy. It's, it's unforced. It's not commanded or taught. It's just a reaction. Shock plus something that's incredibly positive. And I think this is the, a definition of resurrection joy. Resurrection joy is this kind of joy. There are many types of joy, but an unexpected joy. Joy, a joyful thing is great at the best of times, but when it's an unexpected joy, it's something special. And you remember it. 20 odd years ago, Penny and I were in Manchester, and my birthday was coming up. In fact, I think it was the day of my birthday. And in the morning, I did what I usually do. I got out of bed and had a bit of breakfast and went to have a shower. I was enjoying my shower very much. Nice hot water. It was, a, it was my birthday, I was having a good time, just having a nice time in that shower with hot water. And all of a sudden, the shower curtain got ripped apart and a grizzled, um, rather uh, ugly face stuck its head round the side of the shower curtain and said, hello, Malcolm. <laughs> and, uh, and it was Charlie Hines, some of you will know from the church in Dublin. And if you know Charlie, you know that's very much the kind of thing you might do. <laughs> I, I had, and I, what are you doing? What are you doing? A, what are you doing in my shower? And B, what are you doing even here? Because he lived in Dublin. And I had no idea. And what Penny knew, but she had conspired that Charlie and his wife would come over to visit for, the, for my birthday weekend without me knowing. I don't think me, Charlie putting his head into my shower was <laughs> part of Penny's plan. I think it was just Charlie. But I, I remember, and it was a shock, but it was also a joy when I realized it wasn't a burglar or an ax murderer, and it was actually Charlie Hines. And, and there's something about those times which is so special. And I think for us now, 2,000 years after this happened, and for many of us who've grown up with this belief, or held the belief of the resurrection for a long time, we can sometimes lose that sense of joy. 
And if Easter means anything, it means a shocked kind of joy. And for a Christian, that's what we carry around with us, hopefully, anyway. And so what I'd like to do today is hopefully help us to have more of that in our day-to-day lives and in my own life as we talk about it today. So we're going to talk about three things about joy from Matthew 28. So let's turn there now, and we'll go to that last chapter of Matthew and talk about this amazing resurrection joy. Matthew 28, verse 1. We'll look at three points today all about joy. Matthew chapter 28, verse 1, it says, After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, which is interesting, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say his disciples came in the, during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of of the age. Wow, what a what an exciting chapter uh, we're looking at here. So we're talking about unexpected joy to begin with. The first 10 verses, unexpected joy. Uh, the, the, the women didn't expect to find what they found, did they? The soldiers didn't expect to have that experience. There's an incredible a sense of the unexpected going on in this chapter. And it says that the women were afraid, afraid yet filled with joy. So let me ask you, What do you think the women were afraid of? (sighs) They've just been told by the angel what's going on. They've just presumably experienced this earthquake, haven't exactly experienced it where they were. And and, but they've met the angel and he he says, go back, tell the other disciples, this, that, and the other, and tell them what you've seen and, and, and have a look. And they've had a look and the body's not there. And they're afraid yet filled with joy. So what are they afraid of? What are they afraid for? Why are they afraid? Any thoughts? What's going on? The men won't believe them. They're afraid the men won't believe them. That sometimes still happens today. <laughs> uh, they may be afraid of that, yeah. yeah. They might think they are hallucinating, um, over-emotional, uh, I don't know, mistaken in some way. 
Other thoughts? Uh, Leon? I'm afraid of the unknown. It's, it's, it's a gear shift. And mm. you know what's going to happen next. Unprecedented. If something unprecedented happens, you can't predict the fallout. Okay. Fear of the unknown. Any other reasons why they might be afraid? I'm not quite sure myself. I'm just curious to know what you think. It's such an odd thing. I'm surprised it's written here. I'd, I'd, I would have written, they were excited and went off and told the disciples, but it's as they were afraid yet filled with joy. What does it tell us about the, the, the state of mind of the women and how, how they're thinking? What would you say? They were afraid yet filled with joy. Try and put yourself in their shoes. Joe? Well, I would say that they, they are very unsettled, yet they are happy because he is alive. Mm -hmm. He's not dead anymore. Right. Okay. Maybe a hope they might see him again. Yes, I mean, they still don't know the full implications of all this. Yeah. And they've, it's not long, only three days before this, they saw Jesus on the cross. So there's still perhaps that fear of what happened to Jesus could be happening again to other people. Is this for real? Is it, for, is it lasting? Is he going to get crucified again? Because they don't understand yet where this is going. We only see it from our perspective. There's a lot of fear there. I wonder whether today some people don't like the idea of embracing the truth of the resurrection because it induces fear. Like, what does that mean? What does it mean if he rose from the dead? What does it mean about me? What will I have to do? How will I view Jesus differently? His, ultimately, his lordship in my life. So there's the joy of the unexpected here. Now, here's the thing. When they meet Jesus, they, they go away from the angel, and they meet Jesus, and he comes, comes to them, and he says greetings, and he says they clasped his feet. I mean, they fall down, and they hold on to his feet, uh, his uh, you know, feet with the holes in and, and where the nails were and, um, and quite, quite possibly not particularly clean feet for all we know in that environment. But they, they, they fall down and they, climb, they hold on to his very feet and, uh, and worship him. And then he says, don't be afraid. Do you see that? Don't be afraid. He understands where they are. He, he meets them where they're at. And he says, you don't need to be afraid because now, now they not only have the promise that he is alive, but they have the reality of knowing he is alive. They've met him. So he says, do not be afraid. And then he says, um, he says, go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Now look at that little word, those two words, my brothers. Go and tell my disciples. Go and tell my brothers. What is Je Why do you think Jesus calls them brothers here? I think there's a message in this to the disciples. What might that message be? Simon? For me, it's equality. Equality? Yeah. yeah. yeah they're, they're, he's not over them in that, in that sense, you mean? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's forgiveness. They've, they all ran away. Even, even these people who ran away and didn't stick with him, he says, oh, my brothers, not, not the ones who ran away. Go and tell them they better meet me this time because I'm coming to meet them. I'm going to get my good telling off, but they better be there. He doesn't say that. He says, my brothers. What else is going on? What else do you think might be a reason he said that? Yeah. Could that be a reason why they were afraid? Because they felt like Jesus was going to... <laughs> maybe. Well, I mean, maybe the women thought when we tell the, the guys that he's risen from the dead, they them, the guys might be thinking, oh dear, we, we, we're in for a reckoning now. <laughs> right, they might have thought that. So my brothers. Isn't it? I think it's touching that Jesus would say, my brothers, not those failures. And I think that's important for us at times when we feel we let Jesus down. We are never less than Jesus' brothers or sisters. We're never less than that. We're always his brothers and sisters. Even at the times when we feel we have let Jesus down. And let's face it, we all do. None of us hold on to the standards that we once claimed we would hold on to. We've all fallen short in that way. 
But still, the way Jesus feels about us is that we are still his brothers, still his sisters. I think it's a very comforting thought. Go ahead. I think that's the end result of what we went to cross and resurrected for. The whole point. Because we were not his brother before resurrection. This is dead because he joined care of the thing. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, we became his brothers and sisters. Excellent. And that's, the, the that's such an excellent point. This is, this is part of the purpose of the resurrection is that Jesus can call the failures brothers, including us. The resurrection is part of the reason for that, and that's why we have this unexpected joy right here in this passage. Um, let's go on and talk about unexplainable joy. The next section from verse 11 to verse 15. Now, the situation with the guards is interesting, isn't it? So there they are. They're guarding the tomb. There's an earthquake. An angel comes down, rolls the, to the stone back, sits on it. His appearance is like lightning, clothes white as snow. The guards are so afraid, they shake. Have you ever been af as afraid as, like that? You know, you're just literally shaking. And, and he became like dead men. I mean, I, I guess they were like paralyzed with fear. Perhaps still shaking, but not moving. Like dead men. And they go and tell the uh, chief priests. So why do they tell the chief priests? Why don't they tell Pilate? Why the chief priests? Right. Pilate was known to be a mean old chap, and uh, other uh, things we see in the Bible, but also other contemporary accounts, show that he is not a fair-minded person. I mean, he would very quickly and easily execute you. So if they go to Pilate and they say, Jesus escaped, or his disciples, whatever, they, their lives might be in danger, but the chief priests, maybe they could get away with it somehow here or something like that. Okay, so they go to the chief priests <laughs> um, and they meet, the, the chief priests meet with the elders, devise a plan, and they give the soldiers a lot of money saying, yours is to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep, if this report gets to the governor, we'll satisfy him. Which, the implication is they'll give a lot of money to Pilate. That's the implication there. So, um, so they do that. Now, why doesn't this story hold water? The story that they're told to tell everybody else about what happened, that the disciples came in at night and stole him. Why, why doesn't that really work? What's going on here? Because they were guards, right? That was their job. There was a lot of them, and they were armed. They were arms, a lot of them. The disciples weren't military people. They Actually, weren't. I'm pretty sure they weren't asleep either. I mean, that's why would you sleep if you're on guard? Isn't it? You're on guard. There's several of you. At least one of you has got to be awake. You should all be awake. But, okay, so it's not. It goes against military protocol, you could say. Opening a tool, tomb is going to be noisy. Yes. Heavy. Yeah. And heavy. If you've seen pictures of tombs, which would be not dissimilar to oh, that one. Okay, this, the stone that covers the entrance is not small. It could be a disc like this, or it could be a boulder. Sometimes they were actual boulders that didn't just cover the entrance because the boulder was shaped like a boulder, it, it slotted into the space, and though, though was bigger than it. So it's incredibly hard to move once it's in place. And these things are really high. I mean, they're taller than me. So they're like a ton, two tons. I mean, this is not, not easy to move, these things. OK, anything else? They just like just run away. They have just run away. Yeah. Their leader has just been uh, crucified. Did they show signs of this kind of courage in the past? No. no. No, the opposite. What would motivate them to go to the tomb and, and steal the body? Where would they put it? I mean, n none of this makes any sense, does it? It's, it's, it's an interesting story, uh, but it doesn't make uh, any sense. The... Um, the thing is, if this story was made up by the Christians, the whole thing, you wouldn't put this in because this is so implausible. 
It doesn't make any sense that the soldiers would even be told to do this. Well, it's interesting. They give, they tell the story of the excuse in the story. They do. It's kind of like giving up. And this, you know, so it's almost like giving evidence against their own story within the story. Okay. Why would you do that if you were making up the story? If you were making up this story, you'd make it a lot more plausible what happened. You'd make it more, you wouldn't put in these things like this. The story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this day. Well, Matthew is writing this probably about 30 years after the events. And Justin Martyr, a Christian writer writing in 150 AD, records that that story is still going around in his day. So this is the story that was circulated and continued to be circulated for many years. Yet, it makes no sense. Uh, it's an odd thing, shall we say. Let me briefly ask you, what are some of the other objections that you've heard to the resurrection? I mean, this was the one that they came up with in the, in, at the time, that the disciples stole the body. And we were all asleep, and we didn't notice the stone being rolled away. We didn't hear anything, didn't notice anything. But anyway, that was the one at the, at the time. What other ma- objections have you heard? to the fact of the resurrection. Yeah, right. The Muslims say that it was someone else. Not it was somebody else. Okay, that, that is said by some people. It wasn't Jesus on the cross, it was somebody else. All right, well, a few he more. Didn't, uh, that he didn't actually die. Or he didn't really die, he, he fainted, mm-hmm. and he was incarcerated for three days, and then came, and then, uh, came, came to himself and woke up, okay? All right, any others? Any other common ones? Sorry? No, it doesn't make any sense, but I just, you know, there are people that have come up with ideas. Um, I don't think so. That's right. Here's the thing. I I mean, there are probably half a dozen to a dozen different theories about what other people think actually happened uh, to contradict, supposedly, this story. But none of the... It takes more faith to believe in the other theories than it does to believe that this is true, in my opinion. That the Romans didn't kill him, that he didn't, that he didn't kill him, that he wasn't dead. I mean, it doesn't make... The Roman soldiers were executioners. They knew when someone was dead. And, in fact, it was their job to make sure people were dead. And if he wasn't dead, then their lives were on the line because Pilate would get to find out about it. And so they knew they were putting a dead man in a tomb. Um, Jesus himself coming, sort of being resuscitated. How did he move the stone from inside the tomb on his own after being in there for three days and nights with no food or drink, having been crucified and whipped half to death? Doesn't make any sense. Um, It was another person, not really Jesus, do you think the disciples didn't notice who Jesus was? They didn't know that it wasn't, wouldn't have noticed that it wasn't him on the cross. And then they, but they preached that Jesus went to the cross. They said they saw him alive again. They, they didn't know it was him. His mother was there. His mother was there. Plus the fact that if, if Jesus really didn't die and wasn't on the cross or came back to life, where did he go after this? And does that mean that his disciples were preaching something they knew was a lie? Because if, if they said they saw him, but they didn't really see him because he just disappeared somewhere, then they were preaching a lie and they knew it was a lie. How would you, why would you then be persecuted for something you knew was a lie? I mean, being persecuted for something you didn't know was a lie, maybe. But if, if this is all a lie, Peter and John and James and Matthew, they all knew it was a lie. Would you be stoned for a lie? Would you stay in prison for a lie that you knew was a lie? It doesn't, none of it makes any sense. It takes more faith to believe in one of those other theories than it does to believe in this, is what, this was actually what happened. It was an unexplainable joy. There's no other way to explain this joy other than the fact that Jesus rose from the dead and began a new life. That's the most rational explanation for what happened, including the birth of the church. But we're going to go on and talk about that in uh, just a minute. Let's, let's go on and talk about that now. Uncont- uncontainable joy. Okay. Third and final point, uncontainable joy. The last few verses here. 
verses 16 to 20. So the 11 disciples go to Galilee. They go to the mountain. They meet Jesus. And they worshipped him, but some doubted. Okay, what are they doubting? How could they doubt? Come on. I mean, before they were people with lacking in faith, right? And Jesus kept rebuking them for their lack of faith. And you, know, you, you, you slow generation. And they got told off for their lack of faith. But now, after the resurrection, some doubted. How could they doubt? What, what kind of doubt is going on here? What are they doubting? What do you think? What are they doubting? They're on the mountain with the risen Jesus, who they know is Jesus and has been risen uh, from the dead. So some doubted. I like some. Maybe Matthew's saying, because some, not me, of course, but, uh, but some, I don't know. But some of them did. What would they doubt? What kind of doubt? What's going on? Any ideas? Some doubt. They worshipped. They worshipped. All of them worshipped, presumably, but some doubted. What did they doubt? It's still quite an improbable story. There's no historical precedent. precedent. Mm-hmm. It all just seem a bit strange still. Very strange. Yeah. They still don't know where it's going. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe they were doubting how it happened. Some, there are plenty of unexplained things in, in this, in what's going on. Because we have to bear in mind the resurrection accounts are not written to tell us how Jesus was resurrected. They're there to show us the reaction of people to his resurrection. That's the point of these accounts. So they're not in themselves evidence accounts. They are more evidence of the reaction and the response. And and this is an interesting response, that some of the disciples who knew it was Jesus doubted. Any other ideas as to why? Simon? Well, it's just like a really amazing trick. I mean, there's just too much. People can't relate to it. Yeah. No, they wouldn't. That's quite right. Hard to take it all in. Yeah. Mm. Doubted. They doubted. I don't know about you, but I, I find that slightly encouraging. Because I doubt. <laughs> I mean, I know Jesus rose from the dead, but I doubt. I believe he died for my sins, but sometimes I still doubt. I don't think these days I so often doubt its reality. But I more often doubt, will it be worth it? Mm. When I get tired, or I get ill, or my knees creak, or I get some bad news, or, or I pour my heart into something for God on his behalf, into a relationship, in helping somebody, or, you know, and it doesn't seem to work out, or doesn't work out well, or hasn't yet worked, that's when I begin to doubt, is it going to be worth it? I don't, yeah, okay, Jesus, I, I, I believe you rose from the dead and I do worship you but is it, is it worth it and how is this going to turn out there are so many things in my life I can't see how it's going to turn out I'm not sure how it's going to turn out with my children I'm not sure how it's going to turn out with my, fam- my, uh, my elderly relatives I'm not sure how things are going to turn out in, in, in my health I'm not sure, there are so many things and, and when you and I face those things in our lives that we're not sure how is this going to turn out, I think that's when we're tempted to still worship Jesus, yes, but doubt. Maybe doubt him, maybe doubt his power. And I'm sure what they were doubting at least was, what does this mean? Yeah. Are you, how long are you sticking around, Jesus? I don't think he said yet, as he, in this passage. He says other places, right? But maybe they don't. How long are you staying? Well, you know, we'll see. He stays for 40 days, but, and what's going to happen after you've gone? And 
What's going to happen with the chief priests and Pilate? And what, and what is, how are we going to preach this kingdom message? And how are we going to convince people that this just happened? The scheme was a scheme. The scheme, that's right, of what they were, the story they were putting out there. I think they're very human. They doubt just like sometimes we doubt. I would say it's probably not an intellectual unbelief that they have problem with here, but a hesitation natural to those confronted by a unique and impossible occurrence. It's that hesitation is the source of their doubt. So the resurrection matters. Let me finish off by sharing five reasons why the resurrection matters, and then I've got a quote which we'll finish with at that point. A couple of quotes. The resurrection matters for five reasons, and this, this, this is true for whether you've been a Christian a year or 20 odd years, or whether you're not even sure you're a Christian, or want to be, but it still matters, and I'll give you these five reasons. Number one, the resurrection of Jesus matters because it is the heart of the good news. Death is defeated. We either live in fear of death and under the sentence of the fear of death, or we live not fearing death. And the resurrection matters because it is the way to not fear death. It is good news. Second reason, the resurrection of Jesus matters because it is proof that he was the Son of God. He was, said he was the Son of God. He said he was to be raised from the dead. He was raised from the dead. And afterwards, we see the women worshipping him, and we see the disciples worshipping him. They didn't worship him before his resurrection. They honoured him, but they didn't worship him. But they worship him after his resurrection because they recognise that this was the final proof that he really was the Son of God. Third reason. The resurrection matters because it is a springboard for mission. It is our springboard for our mission. It is what launches us as Christians with the good news into the world around us. It sends us out. The fourth reason, the resurrection matters because it means that Jesus' power and his presence are available to everybody. His, like Joe talked about in our welcome today, Jesus is with us and in us, therefore we have resurrection power within us. It means we can change. It means we can grow. It means we can overcome anything that God has in mind for us to overcome. And his presence is with us, meaning he goes with us always. He has all authority and he is with them to the end of the age. That is a powerful aspect of the resurrection. And fifthly, finally, the resurrection matters because it is the key to eternal life and a new community. In the book of Acts, the people of, of Christ gathered together in a new community because of the resurrection, not because of the cross. But the, the cross led to the resurrection, and therefore they gathered together because they had new life. And the resurrection is the key to that. A couple of thoughts here. This quote from Michael Green, the 11 were no more a frightened rabble they became an apostolic task force. Before the resurrection, they were a frightened rabble, scattered and fearful. After the resurrection, nothing could stop them. No persecution, nothing. Nothing stopped them. And this longer quote here, which I'll read for us. This comes from a book by Andy Stanley called Deep and Wide. This longer quote. A small band of Jewish dissidents defied a superpower and a religious system that had been in place for a thousand years and in the end prevailed. At the center of the grassroots movement originally referred to as the way was a G Jewish carpenter whose messages centered on a kingdom that wasn't directly connected to this world. He spoke mostly in parables that few could understand. He insisted that those who followed him love the Romans and pay those onerous taxes. He alienated the influential and the powerful. He offended practically everybody. His family thought he had lost his mind. After only three years of public ministry, he was arrested, publicly humiliated, and executed. Sounds like the perfect way to start a movement, doesn't it? But it gets even stranger. After his execution, Jesus' dispirited and desperate followers claimed that he rose from the dead and that they had seen him, touched him, 
eaten with him. Then, within weeks of this alleged resurrection, dozens and then hundreds of people within walking distance of where Jesus was buried believed this nonsense and began telling others. Before long, Jerusalem was filled to the brim with followers of the way. When resistance from both Rome and the Jewish authorities broke out, several members of the original group were executed and the followers scattered. Now, if this uprising had been like the dozen or so similar messianic uprisings that had occurred during this same slice of history, it would have passed as a mere footnote of history. But this one was different. Everywhere they went, followers of the way insisted that God had done something unique in their generation. He had raised a man from the dead. In a relatively short amount of time, this Jewish knockoff religion replaced the entire pagan pantheon of gods as the primary belief system of the Roman Empire, the same empire responsible for crucifying its central figure, the same empire that launched several vicious inquisitions with the intent of stamping it out completely. Doesn't really add up, does it? Not without an actual resurrection anyway. Nothing makes sense except that the resurrection is real. It's, an uncon it's a joy beyond all joys. The joy of the resurrection is yours and mine today, my friends. Let's enjoy that joy. Amen.